Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure and privilege to welcome you all to the sixth international conference, Media and Technology, conducted by the Department of Visual Communication, SRM Institute of Science and Technology, Kartangulpur. Uh, this conference represents a unique opportunity for us to uh, come together to exchange ideas and insights and to gain new perspective on the issues and challenge that we are facing in our field. After five consecutive con successful conference, this is a sixth year of a conference. We, we just wish uh, this would be another successful conference with all of your wishes and support. And we are honored to welcome our chairperson of this session, Dr. T. Patmanabhan, Assistant Professor of Visual Communication Department, SRM Shop Science and Technology. Once again, we are happy to welcome you, sir. It's a good morning, uh, participant. Uh, I'm Dr. T. Patmanabhan, uh, organizer, co-convener of this conference. And also, uh, I have uh, expertise uh, in the field of media and communication research. So over eight years of experiences and plus three years of research experiences. I'm very uh, happy to chair uh, this uh, session. Uh, so because uh, uh, this session not only uh, like restricted to only one category like new media technology or film and ODT traditional media, it's everything is uh, included. So it's a bit interesting to listen to all of your papers here. And uh, I'm happy to discuss also. Uh, so can I have the first presentation, uh, Mr. Sanish? Yes, sir. So we call upon Neola Joseph de Souza from Christ University. And the topic is a study of the role of social media influencers in creating awareness of mental health on Instagram. Can oh, you... hello, sir. I'm here. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, you are audible. You can share your PowerPoint presentation. Oh, yes. I'll just share my screen. Yeah. Uh, is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. Uh, okay. Can I go ahead with it? Sure, ma'am. You can start. Okay. Uh, so good morning, everyone. This is Neola D'Souza from Christ University. And uh, first of all, I would like to thank SRM for giving me this opportunity to put forward my presentation and findings. So my topic is on screen, which is a study of the role of social media influencers in creating awareness of mental health on Instagram. So firstly, I would uh, like to, uh, you know, tell why I selected this topic. So one of the reasons is because uh, I am a so so uh, influencer on Instagram myself. And uh, secondly, is that I have been battling with uh, mental health issues since the last seven years and uh, been in therapy for that. So this is why this is a topic of my interest as I'm an avid user of Instagram. So uh, my main objective was to understand how social media influencers on Instagram spread awareness on mental health among the youth. So this is because uh, since the pandemic came and uh, we all were confined into our four walls, the only thing with us was social media and uh, we were too active on Instagram. And uh, this was the only time where, uh, you know, people were connecting on Instagram. And I feel that people who are already battling from mental health issues look for it in a way to find a safe space of seeking help. So uh, my review of literature, it uh, consisted of that this is how I've divided it. It was about social media and its usage among the youth, Instagram and its popularity and the concept of influencers and mental health awareness in India. So for a long time that we know that uh, mental health has been a taboo in India and uh, with time we have obviously opened up to the concept and uh, that it's not just a term but it's a real issue and it's an illness which we uh, which quite a lot of us suffer from and uh, coming to Instagram and its popularity uh, Earlier, Facebook was one of the applications where, uh, you know, people used to be active on. But later on nowadays, it has shipped to Instagram and uh, there's a lot of content posted on Instagram. It is not just for, you know, it is not just for posting pictures and videos, but it has also become a place where people uh, bring up their businesses and uh, to give the to give them a valid recognition. So uh, coming to the concept of uh, Ms. influencer. Miola, sorry for interruption. Uh, can you uh, go a little faster because time there's a time limit. Okay, you can yeah, go sure. with methodology and other stuff. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'll come to that. 
so these were my research questions. Uh, so my main objective of the research was to know that how uh, mental health influences, you know, engage with their audience on social media. And that was the reason I did an analysis on the content. I, I selected two uh, mental health influencers and uh, well-known influencers and their content, whatever they posted on Instagram. And uh, the other thing which I did was uh, I had an online survey with people between the age of 18 to 25 uh, which helped me know why do they seek help on instagram from uh, mental health influencers and uh, i also interviewed two psychologists and uh, i got to know their perspective and how uh, they find the gap between connecting uh, mental health on instagram and uh, their perspective as a psychologist so now everyone who's on instagram is not who post awareness on mental health is not necessarily a psychologist it can be just a normal person who's sharing their experience with the audience so uh yeah so basically, my conclusion gave me a few things, which is that uh, actually Instagram has helped people uh, from our, our age group, which is 18 to 25, to open up their problems online. And they have found the space, safe space in connecting with people with the same issues and uh, nobody to be judged on. The content posted by mental health influencers is very important for the audience to engage. So whatever content these social media influencers post on Instagram, it is very necessary that these um, like followers like us, we engage with the content. We either follow them, we take their tips or whatever hacks they post to get over it. And this is what I spoke about. The third point, influencers that are psychologists tend to post more reliable content on Instagram. So when I had the interview with the psychologist, uh, I believe that the psychologist gave me a perspective that it is more reliable to uh, follow psychologists on Instagram rather than uh, taking advice from anyone else. But also one more thing, which is the fourth point, it doesn't solve mental health issues, but guidance to get help is provided like instagram will help you to you know understand your problems but the only guidance you can get is through connecting uh with a real psychologist one more thing instagram which is uh, which i found in my study is that instagram has helped to you know uh oh, let people open up and push them to you know actually seek out for help in real life uh so i guess that is uh, mostly what the whole of my presentation consists of yeah, uh, Neola, it's a good topic. Am I audible to you all? Uh, yes, sir. just a minute. Can I stop sharing? Yes. Yeah, okay. Bit of short throat. Okay, I hope uh, it's not uh, like uh, disturbed here. And uh, see, uh, it's a very interesting topic and also it's a needed one. Okay, everybody is using Instagram, all the instas. Okay, there is a, a, a question mark that. Uh, the social media influence, right? Not only the mental health, even the products, okay? So if they are popular, they are used to like promote some uh, like uh, products, brands, even that social media influencers as like a, a, they are worked as ambassador for doctors, medical practitioners. So this doctor is good. This psychology is too good. Okay, I went, I had a treatment for six months. We don't know the reality really they went really they practiced or not okay so in your research part how we can trust that social media influence because uh nearly like a false disinformation misinformation is happening okay it is like you know like a network society nowadays okay society is connected with uh, many social media platforms but most of the answers are using instagram so did you check how we can trust the social media influencer uh, in yes. a mental health? Uh, yes, sir. So the two uh, influencers which I took, uh, one of them was a psychologist and one of them was not a psychologist. Uh, one person who was, uh, she is the more famous one, obviously, the one who's a psychologist. So her, uh, she also, you know, as you said, that does become a business also. So she does promote her uh, clinic as well and she does promote herself saying that you if you need anything you can come to me this is my contact information and she is a psychologist the other one is a person who is a 
you know a person who has gone through anxiety and depression and uh, she is someone who shares her experience and how she overcomes with it so mostly i believe that people uh, obviously look for authenticity and the credibility over there uh, but people connect to both of them because one of them is a real psychologist and the other one who is putting out information is someone who's gone through it now that part is correct this is a research gap that we don't really know whether she has gone through it or and also important that if social media influences a representation of any mental health or psychologists or doctors anything related to health field health communication if anything happened bad if they take responsibility as uh, that i'm not aware about but i believe that they should be taking responsibility of that uh, okay because you know like uh, now uh, like uh, uh, all the people or some organization some group of people are again some online uh, platforms like uh, uh, like a rummy are playing cricket this kind of uh, thing okay they are uh, find some uh, you know like a bad thing is there okay so even those who are actors or maybe the celebrities they are against that celebrities why they are representing they are not taking the responsibility they are paying so uh, one of the you know like a member maybe they are getting a money but so the impact is uh, like uh, on the society uh, much more than what they are getting so for example uh, so practically there is a problem that if you want to find a doctor in the hospital mm. good psychologist for any doctor but social media helps to help us to find a good doctor mm. i accept that but how to check the genuinity most of the social influence social media influencers they are uh, practically i'm speaking is a business oriented okay if you are a social influencer mm. are you stick with only one product or one doctor one psychologist no no those who and all paying okay you are representing yes okay then this is the problem comes i practically know one doctor is there he is like uh, doing a service in a big hospital but she never posted any content on social media she is working in that hospital okay but she has a to contact the doctor you have to go to her clinic has to be taken care by the hospital maybe like apollo or mira sorry uh the kaveri or many big hospitals are there okay after the surgery again you have to go for the treatment in the clinic okay there is a business behind so my suggestion is this is not a question uh, when you was study you supposed to limit your study and also it should be considered with any ideology what people can do on social media instagram so what will happen in the future if you all the influencers like social media and pms without any knowledge someone is following there okay there is a chance of misguiding okay that part even in your study you have to take care that's what then apart from that it's a wonderful topic you can include incorporate some suggestions and you can work further and you can send for publication okay that would be better okay it's okay, very sir. interesting thank topic. you so much for your insight thank all the you. best thank you so much niyala now we'll call upon the next participant uh, shanita tangadure post graduate from christ university and melijo thomas assistant professor from prashi university and the topic is brand growth through instagram ads so you can share your presentation hi sir good morning am i audible yes ma'am sure audible yes uh, i'm so sorry but my co-author won't be able to join me because he is an assistant professor so he has classes going on at present so he is unable to join yeah it's okay and you can share yeah your... i'll share my screen yeah thank you is my screen visible sir 
Yes, ma'am. Your screen is visible. Okay. So um, my topic is brand growth through Instagram ads, and I, Shanita Tangadare, I'm the I'm the author, along with Dr. Melchor Thomas, who's the co-author. And uh, before I start, can I have your permission, sir, to start the presentation? Yes, ma'am. We can start. Thank you. So I would start by first saying that, uh, as mentioned earlier by the previous presenter, that Instagram is uh, prevailing all over the world. So I would just start by first explaining why I have chosen this topic. It's because there are many brands who have spoken, uh, many research papers who have spoken about uh, different social media marketing strategies, techniques, uh, different social media platforms, but none of them has uh, focused on Instagram particularly. Therefore, I have chosen this topic. Uh, after going through the ROL, uh, I found out that uh, researchers have spoken about influencer marketing. They have spoken about the feminine perspective of how brands can influence the uh, female. They have spoken about how sport, uh, sports brands are uh, coming up with all these concepts. And also they have spoken about very few demographics to be precise. They haven't spoken about uh, any such demographic that can actually influence the um, the brand growth which is happening on Instagram. So I have chosen age and gender as two uh, topics and two demographics that need to be uh, read for any brand to know their target audience and how they have to react to it. So I have chosen also uh, five dimensions that is brand attractiveness, brand awareness, purchase intention, consumer behavior, and brand satisfaction. Brand satisfaction, I have uh, clubbed brand trust and brand loyalty into brand satisfaction because if there is trust, then there is loyalty towards a brand and the person tends to be satisfied with it. Uh, I have used two theories, the uses and gratification theory by Katz and Bummer and the public sphere theory of Habermas. Uh, why I have chosen the uses and gratification theory is because uh, when a person looks at a brand on Instagram, they see the ads, they go, they check out the product, they go, they check out the brand, they engage with the product, they comment, they share, they like, they send it to their friends, they talk about it, they post about it. And if they are satisfied with the services that they have received by a particular brand, they also tend to post it on social media, particularly Instagram. They'll tag the brand, they'll express their gratitude, how they felt about it. So that is a reason why I've chosen the users and gratification theory. And though I am aware that social media is not a public sphere, but the reason I've chosen public sphere theory is because uh, in the olden days, like the small tea holders, like tea stalls, people would stand, discuss their perspectives about the current affairs, tell people what they feel, get feedbacks, know more about it. Similarly, the same thing is happening on Instagram as well. If a person likes a particular brand, they'll tell their friends about it, they'll post about it, they'll uh, express how happy they are with the service or how happy they are not with the service. It can be positive and negative both. That's why I've chosen the public sphere theory. My objective for this study is to identify the relationship that brand attractiveness holds with consumer behavior, brand awareness, brand satisfaction, and purchase intention, and also to determine the role uh, brand attractiveness has to play in creating brand awareness. Uh, the methodology was quantitative methodology, and the tool that I used was the survey tool to collect the data. Um, according to Keller's model in 2001, uh, the data collected, if it's the, if the the collected data is from a sample of 175, then it can be generalized to a population of 320, 320 sample population. So my collected data was 176, which is why I stuck to the nearest, that is 320. And um, also my targeted audience was 15 to 31 years of age. 15 to 24 is young adults and uh, 25 to 31 is adults, according to the UNESCO Institute of Statistics for Central Asia. and uh, so I would say that my population is for younger, for young adults and adults. Uh, these are the demographics and the dimensions that I used. Age and gender are the demographics, and then there are the five dimensions. The major findings that I saw was that brand attractiveness significantly does hold a relationship with consumer behavior. 
Now, why is that so? Is because any person who is attracted to a particular brand on Instagram, they tend to talk about it in a positive way. If they are not satisfied, then they tend to talk about it in a negative way. So a consumer's behavior is perceived how the brand portrays itself on Instagram. Also, gender had a role to play here because brand attractiveness, uh, I, I'm, I wouldn't be uh, talking about how it influenced, but yeah, different genders had a different perspectives about the different brands that they saw. The brand distribution for me was into four parts, uh, two clothing brands and two cosmetic brands. Clothing brands were H&M and Zara, and uh, two cosmetic brands were Nika and Maybelline. This was my uh, field of interest, so I did the same. Then I will explain how brand attractiveness holds a relationship with brand awareness. So brand attractiveness directly uh, had a relationship with brand awareness because if the brand was attractive enough, there was a relationship between brand awareness as well. People would talk about it. They'll go spreading about the information to their friends and everybody. People who don't know about it will also come to know about it because the other person was attractive and they are talking about it. So that is why brand attractiveness did have a uh, relationship with brand awareness. Brand attractiveness also had a relationship with brand satisfaction because if the brand was portrayed to be attractive enough, people would go and check out their brands. If they trust the brand, they will purchase. If they purchase once and they are satisfied, they will purchase again, leading to brand loyalty, which is why uh, brand, as I mentioned, brand trust and brand loyalty were the two uh, subtopics of brand satisfaction. Therefore, brand attractiveness can also influence brand satisfaction. Then brand attractiveness also influences purchase intention. As I mentioned that they would go and purchase the product. If it's good, they like it. If they don't, then they won't. So I'll just uh, highlight one example here. Also before that, I'll just explain that brand attractiveness also holds a role in creating brand awareness is because uh, a few days back when I was talking to a friend of mine, she expressed that she doesn't use any of the online, um, you know, food buying apps and she doesn't like it. She doesn't like food delivery and everything. So she won't, she doesn't have any of these apps on her phone, but she follows Zomato on Instagram. And that is because Zomato uh, shows itself in a funny, humorous way. They are creative about their products, about what all they have to offer, the services, discounts, everything. So she also sometimes when we think about ordering food, She'll come, she'll talk to us and be like, hey, why don't you order from Zomato? They are offering this. They have this. They have this discount going on. They have these offers coming up. So why don't you uh, order from them? Because she is attracted to a particular page uh, of the Instagram, which is which belongs to a brand. She's coming and telling us. So it is creating an awareness for us as well that yeah, brand attractiveness uh, because she feels attractive, we are also aware that they have uh, certain discounts and offers going on. So these were some of my major findings. Limitation of my study, I would just say that uh, because I was only aware about the population that uh, only the targeted audience that I had was I aware about. So that was one of my drawback. Uh, the random selection of the population would also have been led to a biased result because uh, you know, like I had just chosen a random population for this particular research, but for my targeted audience, so it could have been biased. Uh, there are available knowledge. There is a very less available knowledge about the population because I already fo all, only focused on two demographics, that is age and gender. So I might have left um, topics and demographics like occupation, location, and so on. I would recommend the further researchers to consider more dimensions other than the five that I already mentioned for a brand. I would also say that they can look at other social media platforms like Snapchat and Facebook for uh, how they are presenting and representing brands uh, for their advertising. And uh, I have also uh, looked, I, have, I haven't had a particular perspective for this study. So I would say that this study could have given a different perspective, maybe the audience or the professionals because my focus was mainly on the people who own the brands and the study is for them. So that could be one. Also, um, when I had uh, 
given the questionnaire to my audience, I had mentioned the videos and the uh, posts that were available for these brands, like the stories, posts, and reels presented by these brands as a means of advertising. So I had mentioned all of these in the questionnaire. It became easier for the person to check what all posts are there and have they come across or not. So it was easier for them to answer to my questions. And it was easier for me to understand their perspective about that particular thing. Also, I would say that the sample size could have been increased a bit more. And uh, yeah, that's all about it. These are some of the references from my research paper. Thank you. Okay. Sir, are there any questions? Uh, I have a very simple question. Why you choose as a simple random sampling? Sir, I chose simple. Yes, Which are the factors influence brand? Simple random sampling. Uh, Sorry, sir. I, I I heard the first question why I chose simple random sampling, right? The question is? Yes, sir. Why? Sir, you're not audible, sir. Hello? I guess there's some technical issues of <laughs> Good okay now. We'll move on with the next center. So I I guess uh, Deepaka is ready with this presentation. So I call upon. Okay, we'll go with the next participant. Uh, next participant is Blanche Fernandez, postgraduate from Christ University, and the topic is 
the impact of Instagram influencer marketing on purchase decision of consumer in Bangalore and empirical study. So is my screen visible? Yeah, your screen is visible and you're audible. You can proceed with your presentation. Just give me one second. Yeah. Just need to switch on my video. Um, okay, so uh, my topic is the impact of influencer marketing on consumers' purchase decisions in Bangalore. So um, the first thing, yeah, so the first thing that these days when consumers open Instagram is they come across an advertisement of any kind, it could be in the form of a story, a brand review, a post, you know, targeted advertisement on your stories, a carousel post reel to promote, promote any specific product or service. And this is something we all go through. And this is why I chose this topic, because now when as soon as we open any social media platform, Instagram specifically, we're bombarded with advertisements. So the main thing that the study aims to find out is how this affects consumers and their purchase decisions. Because in recent years as well, um, shopping based um, based on, shopping online has uh, really boomed and because of that like Insta Instagram influences our decisions a lot like from you know seeing a review by your favorite influencer by your friend or by the brand itself so um, that's basically what I was trying to study here the methodology that I chose was um, mix a mixed method which was I think sequential exploratory method which was quantitative in nature first and then qualitative so in the quantitative part I did an online survey with simple random sampling of about 150 participants only from Bangalore and then after that I did a focus group discussion I did an export interview and um, like I said sequential sequential explanatory so not exploratory sorry uh, was used and um, the reason I chose a mixed method was to overcome the limitations of a single design um, so basically what I did was I uh, took my observations from the quantitative and I somehow backed, I backed it up with my findings on the qualitative part of my study. And I also, um, the research theory that I used to back the study up was users and gratifications theory. So my uh, review of literature, I had it in four sections, which was social media and communication, defining com consumer behavior, advertising via social media that I already spoke about, and influencer endorsements via social media that I already spoke a little bit about. Um, this research paper in particular is where I got my standardized questionnaire from. So I adapted it um, and I made my questionnaire based off this research paper, which was a similar topic, but I focused more on Bangalore. And the main, so after my ROL, the main topics um, or focus that I wanted to keep for the study was Instagram as the social media platform, the purchasing decision, the influence on the consumers. So these were my research questions that I um, uh, divided in, in, in four dimensions, which I will come to in the analysis part. So it was what about social media marketing influences the consumers purchasing decisions among the youth of Bangalore? Um, does the de declaration of an advertisement on Instagram influence the consumer in any way? Does it add to the credibility of the brand? By this, I mean that um, ASCI now has guidelines for influencers where they have to declare if it's a sponsored ad, a pay, um, you know, a, if it's gifted, if it's any kind of partnership that they're receiving any sort of monetary remuneration for, they have to declare it. So does that, from the consumer's perspective, add to the um, credibility or when they don't add it, does it take away? Like, does it make them trustworthy, basically? Then what is the role of digital marketing agencies in influencer marketing? What um, affects the most according um, to the marketer's impact on consumer perception and engagement process? And what is the um, influencer or brand's influence on the consumer? The research ob objectives were to analyze the people's perception towards um, influencers on online platforms, Instagram specifically, to understand um, influencer branding in the context of Instagram, to find out the role of digital um, agencies, and to evaluate their influence. So um, like I said, I created four dimensions and I divided my research questions accordingly to figure what um, fits best in which method. So from all of that, this is what I, the, the dimensions were credibility of the influencer and brand, consumer perception, brand and influencer influence, and use of advertisements. So what I found out from the credibility is that from, from the consumer side, what mainly um, 
in their eyes makes the consumer credible is how they relate and their engagement rate with the brand's image that they are promoting so it's basically how and in how much how relatable is one particular influencer to me like do i see myself buying that brand what is it about it that makes them makes me want to buy that brand like for example if i'm looking at cosmetics and i want to buy say a foundation i will look towards an influencer who has a similar skin tone as mine and that's how um, some angle of trust and relatability comes in and then uh, there's consumer perception. So again, uh, consumers today are not naive. They don't give, like, there are a lot of gimmicks going on on social media from influencers and brands to get you to purchase a per certain product. But consumers today now are picking up on that as well. And they are, they understand that as buyers, they hold the buying power and they cannot be easily persuaded. But like I said, by being a credible and honest source of information, and if you build that trust factor with your audience as an influencer, you can get them to, have a loyal um, follower base, at least to a certain extent. And then I come to um, the influencer and brand influence. So today, influencer uh, marketing is booming. The digital um, social media industry is booming. And that's why um, I also, in, my expert is, well, I'll come to that actually. Uh, yeah, so every brand today is get making a social media handle, promoting their product on Instagram. And in that and that is working and it is bringing in the desired numbers and sales for them. So that that's one thing. And then the use of advertisements on Instagram is, again, same, like I said, that it's booming and now advertisements have always been a part of consumers' lives. But now in social media era, it's been in a very different way because now it, you, you are surrounded by it as compared to back in the day. So um, this was how my quantitative analysis looked. This is just like I've put in two graphs. I had about 18 questions. Um, so like I said, this was the age group, which was 18 to 40. And the majority of the part, uh, respondents were from the age group of 18 to 23, which were the most active Instagram users that constituted for more than half the um, sample. And then, like I said, the online survey was conducted and I sent a Google form to about 156 people. And the major finding that I felt was, um, was this question in particular, that are Instagram influencers credible sources? Now, as you can see, the majority, so in terms of credibility, honesty, reliability, Sincerity. So as you can see in this graph, the majority of people have disagreed, which was the major sentiment when it comes to people and consumers trusting Instagram influencers. So yeah, then um, these were the other two. So I did a focus group discussion with seven participants from Bangalore. Again, it was like four men, three women, and the age group was again 18 to 23 and 24 to 29. And um, the main finding from this was that the entire group that we were sitting, so a lot of them were like not Instagram influencers, it, it ranged that way. But the main um, sentiment was that they agree with the ASCI guidelines for Instagram um, in influencer marketing on how, you know, they believe that personally by them, uh, by them citing their reference that this is paid, this is not paid, does influence their decision. And they do support that. And they see that the trustworthiness of an influencer comes from personal experience. Like I shared the example. And then my expert was from a digital marketing um, agency in Mumbai with experience of 10 years. And what my expert said, what I spoke to my expert mainly about Thanks, is digital marketing. Sorry for interrupting. Can you go to a conclusion? To a conclusion? Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so the conclusion was um, advertisements still obviously um, instill a desire for like a specific product. And so this, um, through this research, what I um, mainly understood was how businesses select um, an influencer and what are the parameters they go into and how businesses can understand better from um, a consumer's perspective what they want to see on social media. So it's basically connecting that gap between the um, what the business owners want to see, what the business owners want the consumers to see and what the consumers want to see. Like, so yeah, it's basically about how um, we can navigate this landscape by just understanding target audiences better, resonating with them more, like just creating more relatability in terms of content and follower count to, in order to make the business boom. So then the limitations of the research were, um, not all social media platforms apart from Instagram were considered. So I only focused on Instagram and I only focused on um, Instagram advertisements mainly, no, nothing else apart from that. And then the scope for further research is like I said, um, this would really help businesses to see how consumers want a social media to be, how they want Instagram influencer marketing to be. So yeah, that's it. Thank you.
Okay. Uh, and Dr. T.K. Sanandma, the very good presentation. I'd like to ask a simple question. One is, uh, you mentioned about that expert group in interaction, right? Expert group mm -hmm. in interview. Yeah. Focus How do you interview. finalize the expert members for your research? So my number one parameter for my export was um, I wanted someone from like a digital marketing agency. And the other thing was that I wanted someone with at least more than 10 years of experience in that field. So they have seen the whole boom of social media. So that would be someone who has been working since I guess 2010 and then has been through the inception of social media in India and would know the ins and outs. So that is how I chose it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, now let's uh, we go with the next participant. Uh, Udita Singhal, postgraduate uh, from Price University, and the topic is people's perception of Instagram advertising of the cosmetic sector that's after the pandemic. Uh, hello, good morning, everyone. So. My topic is consumer perception of Instagram advertising of cosmetic sector after COVID pandemic. So the COVID pandemic that started in March 2020 has led to changes in the surroundings and behavior of the customers. It has also made advertisers shift from shift towards digital forms of advertising. And one of them were Instagram. So I have taken Instagram for my study. So the rational behind my study is to uh, study the uh, changes in Instagram advertising of specifically of cosmetic sectors. Uh, after pandemic and it affects on uh, consumer perception as part of states that forming a perception plays an essential role in the life of consumers. So the relevance and background of the study states that social media advertising is an, ep an, is an ever evolving uh, area and this research also investigates about the uh, consumer's perception of Instagram advertising of cosmetic sector, particularly focusing, uh, focusing on the post pandemic uh, period. The theory which I have taken for this research is IDA, which is the basic communication theory and antonym of attract, interest, desire, and action. Coming to the gap of my study, uh, one of the gaps which I found during my ROL was minimal research on cosmetic sector social media advertising uh, during the post COVID pandemic and the interlink between consumer perception and the post COVID pandemic uh, social media advertisement was also found uh, inadequate. Uh, coming to the methodology, I have used mixed, mixed methodology for my research, which includes quantitative and qualitative. For quantitative, I have uh, taken survey, and for qualitative, I have taken an expert interview. So the present, uh, the present research is assisted by embedded, embedded uh, experimental model, which is a two-phase study. Uh, the quantitative data will establish the study, and the qualitative data is the subgrant, which is the methodology. Coming to the research objective, uh, since this research paper is narrowed down from the dissertation, so I took three research objectives for this uh, paper. Uh, one of which was to understand the relationship between the quality of advertisement and the consumer behavior. Uh, the next one is to examine the uh, impact of elements mentioned in an Instagram advertisement, both visual and video, and its application with the formation of purchasing decision. Uh, and the third one was to explore if the companies change their advertising strategies on Instagram to gain more attention and how the quality of advertisements influences it. Coming to the uh, study uh, phase one of my research, which is the survey, the sampling technique, which I use a simple random sampling technique, and the sample size was 145. Uh, the data sources were cross sectional study, and the tools used for uh, online Google Forms is the structured questionnaire with 38 items, uh, excluding the demographic factors. The data analysis was done using IBM SPSS, uh, and the statistics used for study were included descriptive and inferior statistics, uh, which basically means multiple regression and linear regression. For phase to expert interview, the sampling technique was convenient sampling technique. My expert was from a digital media agency, uh, Socio Wash, and he has 10 years of experience of advertising, including both digital advertising and traditional advertising. Uh, to go forward with my expert interview, I provided him with a semi structured questionnaire with 13 open ended questions. And the analysis was made using crystallization and emotion technique. Coming to the conclusion of my study, uh, first of all, um, uh, from my expert interview, I got to know that during the pandemic, the pandemic was divided into three phases for advertising. One was the pre pandemic, uh, pre pandemic, which, uh, and the mid pandemic, and the post pandemic. 
so the it was a two way road and it totally depends upon the advertisers how they use the tools available to them and how they move forward uh, to attract more potential customers for their brands uh, it also indicated a positive impact of changing strategies on instagram for promoting a brand after the pandemic and it also indicates that quality of advertisements influences the consumer perception about the brand uh, also it also highlights the importance of elements used in instagram advertising uh, by advertisers and how it helps to gain customers attention and further leads to uh, purchase intention uh, coming to the limitations of my research uh, the one of the limitation of my research is that the study focuses only on cosmetic sector and the second one is uh, it only focuses on two years which is uh, 2020 to 2022 uh, and finally the recommendations uh, by this means of the study uh, cosmetic companies can un uh, better understand the factors which influence the consumer perception of uh, instagram advertisement and affect their purchase uh, intention and altering the content in a way the audience wanted will help them attract more customers and create a robust digital image of their brand Okay, a simple and uh, crispy presentation. I'd like to ask a simple question. You mentioned the word uh, after pandemic, but uh, did you, uh, when you before started research, what are the scaling of consumer behavior before pandemic? Did you mention new research? Yes, sir. I have mentioned that uh, this research is fo uh, particularly focused on the COVID pandemic. Are you audible? Hello? Hello? I'm not audible, what are the uh, growthing status? Sorry, what are the growthing scale of uh, before and uh, we only mentioned about the after pandemic? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. So my uh, research paper clearly mentions that this research will particularly focus from March 2020, which uh, from where the uh, COVID pandemic started. Thank you so much. The next participant will be Jessica Pinto, postgraduate media and communication studies, Christ, Christ University, Bangalore. Uh, the topic is exploring narratives of plus size female protagonists on screen through the series Shrill, a critical discourse analysis. Jessica, you can unmute your mic. Good morning. I'll just share the... Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you're audible. Okay. Good morning, everybody. The purpose of my research paper is to explore the narratives of plus-size protagonists on screen through critical discourses. The body has been an important cultural, political, and social symbol in society. And um, in a book called Natural Symbols, Mary Douglas pens down her thoughts on how the body takes different forms in a social context. Through the series and the dialogues, we understand how society perceives plus size bodies. Exploring these themes will also help future filmmakers and researchers understand the importance of accurate and authentic representations of life. So the methodology that I have chosen is a qualitative analysis and the theoretical framework is Fowler's CDA model. The reason I've chosen Fowler's CDA model is because it underlines the importance of including linguistic analysis and social background research in a discourses critical examination. Um, now the introduction, coming to the analysis part, I have chosen the series Shrill. It is an American comedy television show that streams on Hulu. The first episode aired on March 15, 2019, and it stars A.D. Bryant, who's also the author and the writer and the actress, main protagonist of the show. This series portrays the experience a person, experiences of a person who is fat uh, and uh, the way society treats her uh, through different uh, forums of her life. Discussion and findings. Um, the film industry has predominantly shown a very singular narrative around bodies, and that is, uh, it usually is like fat is undesirable and thin is beautiful and desirable in society. And it's only now that after the new wave of you know body positivity and body acceptance that the film industry is expanding on that narration. 
uh, this show is important as it is one of the few shows that draws from personal experiences. And many times uh, shows, shows use uh, fat suits in order to, you know, portray fat characters like Friends, Big Bang Theories. And so it's a, uh, you know, it's a major trend that I've noticed through this research that uh, a lot of times the protagonists, they usually, they use like fat suits in order to portray these characters. And this is one of the shows that doesn't do that. It doesn't promote the uh, toxic, uh, you know, representation of uh, fat lives. And uh, okay, so so I have chosen four uh, scenes. So the first scene that I've chosen is "Get Tone" by Tanya. In this, Annie is met by an instructor who, you know, uh, uh, like provides a lot of unsolicited advice on how uh, on how to lose weight, etc. And uh, uh, this uh, scene shows us how like society usually it takes it, it they take it upon themselves to you know tell people uh, what they should do and what they shouldn't do with their bodies the second scene that I've chosen is uh, a conversation between Annie and her mother uh, this show is very important this scene is very important because it portrays how important uh, the relationship of a parent is to a child and how they are uh, the parents views on the body uh, affects the child's perception of their body into adulthood also. The third scene I've chosen is Lady uh, Lazy Body and Lazy Minds, in which it portrays how workplace, uh, you know, culture can affect a person's body image as well. Your, uh, uh, the, the boss in the scene uh, uh, has this perception of Annie that she's very lazy and she doesn't do her work on uh, properly, even though she does her work on time. Uh, the fourth scene is Annie's monologue, which is like the breaking point of the whole show where she uh, she finally stands up for herself and then she finally like there's like uh, she finally accepts herself for the way she is. And uh, in the monologue, she talks about all the times um, she's felt like uh, there's a lot of importance uh, kept on uh, her body and the way uh, she has to perceive it. So coming to the conclusion, the show provides us authenticity and it helps us grow as a film industry to include all types of narratives, uh, which also provides a space to grow and connect as human beings, interacting with different narratives. These series both uh, questions and also produces prevailing societal beliefs about how fat lives are perceived. As more shows continue to focus and include experiences like th these, uh there's more representation in society um <clears throat> yeah coming um i've come to the conclusion of my presentation thank you thank you jessica uh can you please show your methodology again okay just a minute um This is my methodology. Okay. Hello. Okay. Other than discourse analysis, have you uh, attempted any other analysis? No, I mainly focus on discourse analysis because I felt like that was more important to my field of study. Okay. Okay, how many samples have you collected, Jessica? So I chose to focus on this one series uh, and I uh, sampled scenes from the series. Uh. Uh, yeah, because this one series, I felt like, uh, like uh, gave me a lot of content to analyze and research upon. Okay, okay, Jessica. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. The next participant will be Anshika Paul. Postgraduate Media and Communication Studies, Christ University, Bangalore. Uh, her topic is violence in gangs of Vazaipur and analysis of violence. Anshika? Uh, uh, yes, am I audible? Yes, you are audible, Anshika. Can you please turn on your video? Yes. Yeah, you can start your presentation.
<clears throat> Firstly, um, good uh, good morning to everybody for giving. Uh, thank you for giving uh, your time and this opportunity for me to present my paper. So um, the title of my paper is "Violence and Gangs of Basipur: An Analysis on Violence." So uh, everybody know that India is well known for its commercial cinema and better known as Bollywood, and we have given them very uh, good masterpieces. Uh, when it comes from the starting to till this time, when we talk about the film industry, I believe film can influence a person person's mind. I'll be talking about a film made by the director Anurag Kashyap, who has been in this industry for more than twenty years, and he has made some brilliant super hit movies like Devdi or Gulal, and also uh, he has made movies on uh, social issues also, which are is Manmarzia and. Uh, more movies he has produced like that, but in this movie, the name is Gangs of Vasipur, which was released in two thousand and twelve. Both the parts, it has two parts, was released in two thousand twelve, and it became a real hit and a masterpiece. That Times of India has also given it the title of the Indian Godfather. Um, I'll be talking about violence since uh, that is the analysis I'm trying to find out that how filmmakers are trying to portray violence and. if they are trying to glorify it what are the tools they are trying to use so violence can be verbal or non verbal but anything which will hurt the other person is considered as violence be it a physical uh, uh, disturbance or a mental disturbance violence in culture uh, has been in this uh, era because uh, i can say this because if we see wrestling or boxing people actually like to see violence and some of them also bet on it basically so why not in movies that is the whole perspective which filmmakers are trying to uh, conceive and then um, throw it towards the audience violence and films um, it started in early 90s when um, bandit queens were released till this date when gappar and other movies like pushpa or drishyam has been released and we have seen that these all incidents are repeating once the movie is released these incidents uh, are actually reported in the court that yes this have been happening and have happened uh, and repeated two to three times have and, and are in court uh, when we move to violence violence is basically glorified in some of the movies and in that pattern where the viewers are directly conceiving to that uh, violence and they are actually appreciating that violence and here the audience is very um, important because they are the one who decides the which film should uh, run or be in the hit list or not so uh, as you can see on the screen i have chosen 12 uh, scenes to um, move on with my uh, research and this is in my uh, content analysis part and these are the scenes and the timings are also mentioned so let's move forward with my methodology i have used uh, multi model and qualitative method i've used unstructured um, interviews which is uh, informal interviews uh, with 10 people 10 uh, male 5 uh, male and 5 female and the age group was 18 to 25 because uh, i believe that not just me but all the studies which i have gone through and researches i have gone through they believe that these kind of movies are basically <clears throat> catering to the, uh, this age group as they are considered as adults or young adults and also i have asked them questions i have asked them seven questions and the questions are as uh, when the when was the last you saw this film how many times have you seen this film according to you who was the hero of the film and according to you what was the most violent scene in the film and if so can you describe it in detail and why do you think it's the most violent because mostly because it's armed and the last question was do you remember the reason for that violence happening in that scene so i have used two theories uh, the first one is magic bullet theory given by paul enrich it in 1850s and uh, it says that um, it is basically a communication theory which suggests that any message is which is given out by a media can be conceived by a viewer very directly and wholly and uh, he will get to take it for example if i'm watching a news and it says that saturday is not a good day for me to go out i might feel he yes they are saying truth because it it is coming on the media the second theory which i've used is cultivation theory and it is given by george gerbner in 1960s and it states that if i am exposed to a media for a longer duration of time and if they are 
for example, if they are telling me that oranges are really good for my health, and I like apple, but eventually I'll start liking oranges in a while. So I believe these theories have been, been uh, I, I can uh, say that my, uh, um, I have conducted interviews and the respondents have, so, I mean, proved that yes, these theories have worked on them when they are watching this film. And one more important point, I've chosen th those 10 people on the basis of that they have actually seen this film before I have spoken to them. So the objective of uh, my this research is uh, very simple, that I wanted to know what are the tools they use for aesthetization of violence. So my questions are, uh, the first one is do filmmakers intentionally aesthetize violence in cinematic narrative? And if they, use, if they do it, what are the elements or tools for it? The second one is uh, different tools of aesthetization of violence, A, to the process of characterization in film and influences people's mind. And if they do, what is the impact and the influence on the audience? So um, my discussion and analysis is uh, I find out five components from my content uh, analysis and the interviews. Um, and it goes on like this. The first one is narrative. So for any movie or any film, uh, I will particularly cater to this film, which is Gangs of Vasipur. The narrative has been very wonderful and it has been imprinted in people's mind. And any movie, uh, uh, if I am uh, the audience, I believe for first 10 minutes, if I'm watching a film, it should be that strong to, to take or attract my uh, attention. That, that's what I will say. So in the starting 10, 30 minutes only, this movie has stated the goal of uh, what is the this part about or the next part will be about, which is solely about revenge, said by the main uh, character, that is Hamari Zangi Ka Eki Maksad Hai, which is revenge. So the next is the unreality of the nature. As, as discussed, many movies are not made on uh, true events. This is also one movie which has been um, basically added all of these spices and uh, they have made it in that way that the audience will actually be attracted towards this movie. The third one is the representation of weaponry. When the violence comes in or kicks in, it's very important for any director to keep weapons, be it guns, uh, be it knife. And particularly in this film, we can see that uh, swords are also used, guns are also used, machine guns, and even blade is also used along with knife. So uh, weapons are also there. And also the fourth point, which is the language, is very important because it builds the gap between the viewer and the sender of that message. In this case, it's particularly the language and this language has been kept very local and which is understood by every people. And uh, the violence also has a bit of humor, which leads us to the fifth point that you are doing violence, but in a humorous way you are doing it. So uh, this is again uh, a wonderful film to watch indeed because it has humor also and violence also. So now if we talk about violence, there are types of violence. This, the first one is the suicidal behavior or self-harm, where the person tends to harm himself. The reason can be uh, varied. The second is interpersonal violence, when uh, a person is fighting with another person. And this violence is basically when you are trying to hurt another person in a physical way, or uh, be it mental anxious or anything, be it trauma too. The third one is violence uh, <clears throat> can be in a large number, for example, political groups or ter terror terrorist organizations, et cetera. The reasons of uh, violence, which I found from my researches, uh, through the researches I read and uh, have gone through, basically are peer pressure. If somebody is slapping, so even I will slap, or I should do that, or uh, alcohol consumption, or witnessing violence at home. And a person being disrespected will might trigger him to uh, do some violent actions or moves. And also early childhood abuse or uh, access to weapons are uh, the other two reasons or triggers for violence here. So basically all the people who watch violent movies are not uh, showing the behavior that they will turn into somebody shown in the movie, but the people who have actually grown up in violence, they have witnessed violence in real life. Okay. They are tend to be violent more ah. in the nature and uh, react in Antica. the same manner. Can yes, you skip to the conclusion part? Yes, yes. So the conclusion is that uh, the tools which I said about the narrative and the storyline, uh, the language, the weaponry, everything is 
uh, glorifying violence in this movie and it's uh, imprinting uh, about the violence in the minds of the audience and that effect is actually long lasting so the tools are justified which i have uh, taken and also uh, i would like to say that people remember the violence very strongly and they are actually happy to tell me and discuss about it and they glorify that violence i could say but when i asked them about the cause of it they were somehow unable to recall it which means that the theories are also justified that they have perceived and taken uh, all those violence in their head but the actual cause they actually don't know they just enjoy looking at it so my uh, study has limitations also that this research has been done in present so later on it might not work and because it's just one movie so uh, it can be constrained and uh, it is qualitative and could be biased in pronounced than usual and time constraints prevented the throughout examination of uh, all the events okay okay uh, uh, good presentation i like to ask a simple question because the movie was released in a decade as a researcher yes, can you give a justification of choosing the particular movie question number 2 is why you restrict the sampling of five male and five, five female what is the reason for uh, restricting five and five okay so um earlier my idea for research was violence itself but in five movies of different languages and that gave me a very wide uh, result and Uh, i was unable to complete it at, at that moment because it's very vast study so then i chose one single and particular movie which is very famous and i've asked many people about it more than 10 people ki have you seen this film or not and they have responded that yes they have seen this particular movie because that is very famous because of the main character which is sardar khan played by manoj vajpayee and the second is uh, i was uh, uh, trying to figure out which uh, Uh, research to use qualitative or quantitative and then i asked my mentor which will be suitable so he asked me to go through all the research papers which have been done on a single web series or a single movie so mostly all these uh, which the framework which they have used is selecting by 50 50 ratio of the male and female and conducting this study so that's how i moved forward with mine Uh, sir, I hope I answered it. So one more question. I am audible. Yes, yes, sir. Okay, mention about types of violences because okay, the based on the uh, literature review, you are going to be making a list of uh, violence will be in the society. But what yeah. did, did you go through the uh, role of cut cut down the violences in movies? the cbfc central board of film certifications regulation of how they are called as a violence scene or violence dialogue what scale they are following it uh, i went through it and uh, there were the sections of um, uh, gore or violent or uh, brutality and this movie particularly caters to brutality and not gore and it comes under armed weaponry and dialogues and verbal abuses and even slangs so this movie is a complete masterpiece in that case and there were some scenes which uh, could have been censored but are not censored because of the type that this is this is provi providing a very raw uh, framework by the director so that's how i chose this movie okay thank you okay uh, thank you anshika the next participant will be shruti d uh, post graduate student media and communication studies christ university her topic is the role of contemporary advertising in bringing about a social change shruti thank you thank you so much i'll just share my screen yeah, is my screen visible Yes, your screen is visible. You can start your presentation. Yeah. One minute. One 
Okay, I'll just uh, start like this, I guess, because I'm not able to uh, put a full screen on it. Okay, got it. Um, sorry. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, my role, uh, my uh, the topic which I'm talking about is uh, my research paper on the topic, uh, the role of contemporary advertisements in creating a social change. Um, so in recent times, in recent times, uh, advertisements have become a significant uh, uh, medium of communication uh, when it, that influences the people's perceptions, their attitudes, and their behaviors. So ads are no longer, they're not seen as something where uh, people sell their products or services. They are, uh, they've become more as a tool to change the people's perception and, their, uh, and the entire culture and the society in general. Um, so uh, for this particular research paper, I have chosen three advertisements, uh, advertisement campaigns. So the first one is the Aerial Share the Load campaign, uh, which talk, which is a beautiful advertisement, which talks about uh, how a mother uh, teaches her son to also do laundry, uh, breaking the narrative that uh, laund doing laundry is not only a woman's job. So that is the first campaign which I've chosen. And then the second one is the uh, Tanish Ekatwa Mad. Uh, so Tanishq always has a very culture-centric uh, uh, concept when it comes to their advertisements. I'm sure you would have all uh, seen their ads. So in this particular ad, it talks about a modern independent woman and the prejudices that are followed uh, and the judgments that people throw at them when it comes at the time of their marriage. So this ad talks about that. And then the third ad which I've chosen is the Dove uh, Real Beauty Test. So it talks about how women of all colors, of all races, irrespective of any of their physical uh, differences, they're all beautiful and they all, all of them should be celebrated. So it should be a source of their confidence. So these are the three ad campaigns. And the purpose of the study is to identify if all these ads actually created a social change. Because so did it actually create a social change in the minds of the people or is it just a marketing gimmick? Or, uh, and also um, it is, are they intended? Are they intentionally doing it? So this is the basic research objectives, like if they brought it a social change or not, and if they are, if that is the intention behind it. So we're trying to analyze how contemporary ads are increasingly being used to create awareness, like promote social causes, and uh, it is how they are used to drive a positive change in the society. Yeah, okay. Um, so the methodology which I've used uh, is a mis mix in method uh, techniques. So uh, an approach that approach was taken. It consisted of both qualitative and quantitative methods. And the three primary uh, techniques that I've used are survey, focus group, and expert interview. So uh, the survey was conducted with a sample size of uh, 130 responses respond and then it gave a broad perspective on the subject matter and uh, the focus group and the expert interview it gave an in-depth insight on the opinions and the experiences of the people from the consumer point of view and uh, because of this mix in methodology i was able to gather a comprehensive and a balanced uh, understanding which helped Ruthie, which please gave me change more, your slide, uh, no? the next one yeah okay so yeah, uh, so I've, uh, my point is that it have chosen uh, expert interview, focus group, and survey. And then for the re, uh, for the theory, I've used representative theory and cultivation theory. So uh, representative theory, what it talks about is how the media uh, it has the ability to form ideologies in the minds of the people. So it is by um, Stuart Hall, and then uh, the second theory is cultivation theory by George Gerber, which uh, says that people who are exposed to media and what is shown on the media, they try, tend to interpret that reality as the uh, as the uh, root cause, and then they uh, and then they form biases in their mind because of that. So I've taken these two theories. And then, so yeah, uh, analysis and findings. So from the expert interview, I uh, interviewed an expert uh, called uh, named Aditya Lokesh Raj. Uh, he is the CEO and founder of uh, Avatar Studios in Bangalore, uh, which has been in the digital marketing platform and in the advertising industry for more than 15 years and is very established. So I asked him these two basic questions. Like, um, uh, do you think when you create an ad, do you think, are you creating it to create a social uh, change in the society is that the intention behind create uh, creating these ads and then the second one is do you th really think that it had an impact did it change the perception of the people after watching the ads so according to aditya what he uh, says is that um so a 30 second ad is not going to uh, change the perception of the people because patriarchy and uh, uh, all these it, it is they've been conditioned to think like that so an advertisement is not going to come and change the perception but what it can be is a catalyst it can be a catalyst to create to start a conversation so once they look at an ad they'll like oh, okay so something like this also exists 
so it can only be a catalyst and then uh, he also mentioned that uh, to create a social change we have to get to get to know the mindset of the people we have to do some groundwork and then create the ad but it doesn't work that way because uh, all of this is just uh, what the client requires so the intention behind creating the ad is not uh, to create a social change it is just as a marketing technique so that was the analysis that i got from the expert interview and then from the um, from the focus group uh, so i had a focus group conducted uh, between eight members and all these three advertisements which i mentioned earlier were shown to them and then uh, from what i could uh, infer from their uh, analysis was that at least it started a narrative so uh, when people who did not know anything about uh, lgbtq community or uh, uh, or who didn't know about lavender marriages so when when they portray ads on these cases people are getting to know and they're uh, they're starting a conversation so and also the lgbtq plus is an untapped market so they are trying to uh, put a marketing perspective to it as well but at the same time they're trying they're creating a uh, narrative which is what is required with the 30 second ad so that is what uh, i got from the um, focus group and then the final one which i had, uh, taken is a survey of 130 respondents and uh, so from the survey i could find out that yeah so uh, 36% of the people they were uh, able they they thought that I'm sorry yeah so 36% of the population from a sample size of 130 they changed uh they feel that they have changed the perception perception after watching these ads uh and then 26.3 they uh they did not undergo any change and they just saw the ad like an ad and then they just scrolled past it so that was the um analysis from the survey and then uh when i asked them like do you think brands like dove gucci or cadbury or ariel for instance do they make progressive advertisements they feel that 73.7% believe that brands are just using ads as marketing techniques they're just using current trends uh, as a marketing technique to promote their product and they just want to stay relevant in the industry so they're not actually intending to create a social change and then um, so they don't want to create a revolution they just want their product to be in the minds of the people and to create a conversation around it so yeah uh, concluding my presentation uh, advertisement has been in the beginning of time and uh, whether we like it or not we have to accept the social change um, so because the because nowadays the customer knows what he wants and then uh, brands cannot do this for a long time uh, so they they try to influence the influence the consumer attitudes but then uh, a real social change only comes when the consumer Uh, it starts with the consumer so we have to start changing ourselves and uh, get more progressive and open minded about the uh, societal changes and not after watching an ad is what uh, i conclude from this presentation okay uh, good presentation how do you what are the scale you are apply to identify the consumer behavior through the particular advertisement will create some some uh, influencing factor of by the product you mentioned about dow kuchi that cadbury is right yes sir yes sir um so uh, to stay relevant there are certain concepts in the society that is arising right now right so like lgbtq plus marriages and then uh, how uh, transgender people are actually coming forward and brands are looking at these concepts uh, so we've been conditioned to think like oh these are all not uh, normal so they are trying to change the narrative and bring it to normal so i looked upon ads which are trying to do that so in, in instance of ariel uh, so all these while in a patriarchal mindset people think that uh, women do the laundry women do the household works and then uh, men are supposed to go to work and then they are supposed to provide for the family but then ariel tried to change that narrative so i only took those ads which are trying to change the general perception of the people in the society and then uh, who are trying to create an awareness around it so i looked at those ads and then uh, i found these brands uh, so ariel dove cadbury cadbury uh, there is was an ad in cadbury like where um, people are cheering for the uh, girls cricket team so so right, right now there is this women premier league which is coming so that has actually created an uh, a change so i've just chosen ads based on that okay thank you okay thank you shruti the next participants is participant is deepak raj post graduate media and communication studies his topic is advertisement and digital media why bother 
an empirical study on milky mist that is digital media presence deepak deepak are you there Yes, I'm able. Just one second. Just presenting it. Okay. Yes. Is my screen visible? Yes. No, the screen is not visible. Yeah, just audible. Okay. Uh. Now. Yeah. You have to turn on your video, Deepak. Deepak you can start your presentation If you have any technical issues please wait I'll put you in the next list okay Uh Okay let's skip to the next participant Audible now No, it is audible, but you have some technical issues, Deepak. Just sort it out and come back. Okay. Uh, I think it's sorted now. I can start with the presentation now. I guess. Yes. Okay. Let's okay. okay, start. Yes. But uh, the video sorry for is the not recording. visible. Oh, one second. Yes. Uh, I hope now it's visible and audible. No Deepak. No. No, I think there's some technical glitch in your system. You can turn off and turn on again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. Now it is fine. Yeah. That's fine now. Yes, uh, you can start the yes. presentation. Okay, sorry for the inconvenience, people. Ah, uh, yeah. So regarding the presentation, ah, uh, my topic is on uh, my research is on the topic of advertisement and digital media. Why bother? So it's an empirical study on Milky Way's dairy's digital presence. So we all know what are social media or digital media is, but then ah, uh, you know the word presence over here means ah uh, how brands portray themselves in social media to increase their brand awareness and to make sure that people know what the brand and what how the unique stand in the market. So talking about Milky Mist, uh, we all know what Milky Mist is. It's a brand that is uh, located in the southern part of Tamil Nadu. Uh, it's in uh, it's based near Eero, Tamil Nadu, and uh, their products mostly include value-added uh, milk products that are that include uh, cheese, uh, milk, uh, curd, ghee, and etc. So as to uh, what the sub brands are, so we know Milky Mist is one single brand entity, but then there are multiple other sub brands that they have also. So, for example, Brias. Brias is a tofu-made brand that uh, Milky Mist acquired during the COVID period, and then Smart Chef and Asil is also one ready to make a uh, product that has been acquired for Milky Mist during same COVID period. The reason for this acquirement because you know when uh, there was COVID happening and people had to make their own home products at their own home, uh, Milky Mist as a brand they acquired these brands so that they can uh, deliver it to the doorstep and make people more aware about their own brands as well. As to why I have to choose Milky Mist is because. Uh, The thing that we don't know about Milky Mist is it's a leading paneer manufacturer in whole of South India. We all know these monopolies like Amul and Hudson, but then we don't know about Milky Mist because it's a very upcoming brand in social media. The past five years is what they have tried to bring in their presence in digital media as well. 
uh, when it comes to the unique designs and social approach, uh, they stand out in terms of their design quality and how they approach themselves in the market. And uh, the third point being, you know, their sudden reach in social media and in digital media as an FMCG uh, brand, as a milk brand, is something that is to be noticed. And uh, like I said earlier, they have brought in many acquired brands under the name of House of Milk Chemist and the Umbrella brand. And also, as to why make a paper on this brand being, there's only been one research paper done on this Milk Chemist brand in 2017. And we have a lot of papers on the brands like Amul, Hatsun and Milk Chemist because they are the monopolies in the market. And uh, when, at the period of time of my research, I, I, I these are the stats that have been found. So the follower base of these particular pages, be it LinkedIn, be it Instagram, all these pages, in the year they came, in, within the span of two years, they were able to uh, compete with the brands that is like in the market for more than 25 years, that is Amul and people. When Amul has in 15 plus K of follower base in LinkedIn, uh, for example, uh, Milkim has bought in 11.3 in the short period of span and the time they could do it. As to regarding the uh, paper that has been published, it has been published by an assistant professor, uh, Mr. Jay Shankar from KCT Coimbatore. He published his paper in 2017, but the gap that I found in this paper was that the data has been very old. It's a research paper of three pages where it talks about the emergence of the brand and what the brand is going to be doing in the future. And it talks about the cold, cold storage of the brand. That's a very precise uh, research paper that has been done on this brand. And this doesn't talk about their social media or their digital presence. So talking about the competition, Amul, Avan, Hatsu, Epigamia, Milma, and few other brands are their competitions, but how Milkima stands out is their design standard and the way they portray themselves in the market. So methodology. So talking about, before methodology, I would like to include about my uh, uh, literature for review as well. So uh, I did my research on uh, dairy industry in India and also how advertisements and how marketing works. So dairy industry, uh, you know, from the year of uh, 2019, the dairy industry has been increasing a lot and we produce almost 23% of global needs of milk in India right now. And uh, to talk about this, I first did a textual analysis on Milkimist page of LinkedIn, social media, and other uh, website and everything that they own. So when we talk about website, I had to include about SEO, I have to talk about uh, how the page has been branded, I have to do how the logo has been uh, made, what does the logo represent, how does how do they portray their uh, presence in social media, Instagram, Facebook, and everything? So I did textual analysis of all their social media pages along with their SEO and along with their website. Second being a questionnaire that I sent out to 150 plus people response to be done. So it is 50-50 uh, response from both female and male participants who have used the products of Milky Mist. So it portrays that uh, what are who have, what are the products have used and uh, why do they think that uh, advertisements through Milky Mist is more. Uh, attractive to them or why they think that Milky Mist products are more deemed in the market. And third is an expert interview that I've done uh, on two people. One has gone so it's mostly based on the agency and mostly based on the people from the uh, market. So the first person being Arjun Danyanji that has been portrayed in the picture over there. He is then, uh, he's a founder and CEO of ATGB Communications, a digital marketing agency that runs uh, Milky Mist to complete 360 degree marketing and promotion. Second is being uh, Amrina. She was the person who was responsible for handling all the accounts of Milky Mist. So I had interviewed with both these people and figured out what all mattered and what all they have done through this particular period of time span. Uh, the objective of this research being to determine the adoption of digital media by brands, how they take it and how they portray it in the market. Second being the, to determine uh, media research to the consumers. Uh, so the questions that came to me in mind, so what are the digital media platforms that are available for a brand to market itself? What are the pl places that they can do it? And uh, how did COVID-19 plays, uh, you know, a role in uh, digital media marketing? So when I said this, uh, Milky Mist acquired a lot of brands during the period. It is to make sure that uh, it reaches the market. So they gave what exactly people needed during that particular time. And that's how they marketed themselves. So through the end of my research, I figured out that. So when I spoke to Arjun or when I had the expert interview, they told me that Milky Mist wanted to be a 360 degree brand that can portray to people's needs and everything. They uh, needed to show that they are the brand that they can trust on. So this is what uh, my research been concluded to. So through my survey that I figured out that uh, uh, people always tend to like the advertisement. So they are forced into advertisements, even though they're not willing to. And uh, even though Milky Mist has been trying to, you know, put, they have been spending a lot on marketing and they've been spending a lot on advertising, but then the conversion ratio from being a viewer to a consumer has been low on through the social media platform, but then they've been trying to uh, expand their presence in media. 
So talking about the finding strategies, so strategies including, so influencer marketing, uh, be it SEO, be it the presence of social media, paid marketing, all this has been done with Milky Mist. The campaigns they have cooked with uh, Milky Mist, they have multiple campaigns through topicals and everything, be it Diwali, Christmas, or uh, any campaign, any topical that has been happening, they try to campaign themselves over there as well. They try to include people who are uh, more accessible to people. They pay them, they get their work done through them. And the design pattern, like the presentation I'm showing you right now, that is a design pattern for them. They try to indicate that blue is a color and white is the, the milk, that is, that is the pattern they're showing to people. And the SEO has been clearly done in a way that if people type about milk or about this value-added products in, uh, in the site, it'll lead to the Milky Mist page. They're spending a lot on SEO as well. And the ad agency, ITGB Communication, is the source that gave me all this information. And it's a genuine source that they can, they're not able to give up genuine numbers, but then they're giving that it's a lot of money spent by the brand to portray this. And the consumer reach is being done a lot. And the agency has been doing a research where they can tell that the reach of consumers has been a lot increased from the year 2019 to 2022. That is the end of the research span. And uh, that thing concludes my saying that uh, even though uh, brands spend a lot on their marketing and advertising, which of course, it's needed at this particular era to make sure that they are being seen by people. Uh, the conversion rates and the consumer reach depends on, you know, the how the offline marketing happens and how the brands portray themselves to the people. And that concludes my research. Thank you. Okay. Deepak. Yes. Okay. Okay. Good. Nice to be sharing now. Good presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, Deepa, can you tell me what exactly textual analysis is? Uh, yeah, can you repeat it again? What is textual analysis? Yes, so textual analysis basically, so we have two types of analysis. One is content and one is textual analysis. So by what I mean textual analysis is that I had to, uh, so we have, a, so for example, they have Instagram page. So I have to make sure that what are the, uh, what are the ways that they have made the designs and I have to, I have to analyze them. So be it from visual analysis or through the textual thing on the copy, be it the way they put the captions and everything, I have to make an uh, combined analysis on how they've done it. What is the consistency that's showing in the page and everything. So the same way I have to do for all the pages, I have, to done, I have done it for their website, I've done it for SEO, for every single page that are available. So during the time of my research, I've, they have seen that they have made like 196 posts during that period. So numbers, stats and everything for every single pages is what I've made by textual analysis. Okay, thank you, Deepak. The next participant is Anmol Bharat, Bharatwaj, postgraduate media and communication studies, Christ University, Bangalore. His topic is news consumption on online news platforms, a study on young adult. Anmol, you can start your presentation. Sure, ma'am. PPT is not visible for us. Uh, can you see it, ma'am? No. Ma'am, no. It is still not visible. Ma'am, just a second. Yes. Yes, yeah. Yes, now it is visible. Uh, so the, ah. first of all, first, uh, both the teachers to give this time to me and uh, this opportunity for me to speak about my research, which I've done from last one year with the help of my mentors. Uh, so my study is basically on how mobile technologies and journalism has combined and come together so called as mobile journalism and how news platforms has converted viewers to not to view uh, news from any paper kind of platform, but from uh, uh, so-called techno uh, mobile technology. So the introduction of my study is basically that I am trying to find out uh, the study which like uh, online uh, consumption of news and by which ways do are they consuming news uh, age group of 18 to 25 because these people are the youth uh, which are more into news these days uh, like uh, 
it has been seen in the history as well like the expansion of internet and the world wide web, web was actually accumulated uh, in the news agencies news magazines broadcast uh, which actually impacted the uh, generation of consumers how to consume news and how to make it also not just not just how to uh, how to disseminate the news but how to uh, how to get the news as well how to consume it so this study when the study came up all the researchers were like the newsroom is going to die the effect of newsroom is going to be changing uh, like everything is going to be new but what i felt was it was just a part of it we we just shared the same space with technology and help it to grow as bigger um, if i talk about my review of literature i'll talk i'll give you an example like how telegram came to existence and it helped booming uh, to gather news and to uh, disseminate news in more uh, wider spread or then how you say typewriters came and helped us to write news well and then telephone came phone came to encourage us to shift you know to help uh, shift of labor inward shift of labor not just outward it was inward also also if i talk about the specific topic in this research in india about technologies and how newsroom is uh, conducting news so then 2020 uh, pranoy roy on his uh, um, uh, you know uh, special at 9 o'clock he said that um, ndt like uh, online news consumption is also the fifth state in which we refer it now and it's very important for the consumers to consume news via online platforms on the same line on the same tangent reuters also conducted a research in 2019 where they showed that uh, 52% of the majority tends to see their news and consume their news from facebook rather than any other uh, you know paper newspaper or any other dedicated website but in my research what i did was uh, like my statement problem is the same like i'm trying to determine the most uh, preferred news platform a uh, famous amongst the news consumers between 25 to 18 age group and how mobile journalists have adapted this work practices and uh, do you think is there a, is there a loophole in the system uh, so my study objectives i just told you but uh, i have conducted the study uh, from um, multi multi model research with the help of qualitative research and a little questionnaire with focus group conducted to it i have conducted my focus group via whatsapp Uh, in diwali holidays just to show that mobile phones can also become that platform where you can have meetings and uh, you can you can take out uh, data from that so in my questionnaire uh, sorry in in my theory i have used the theory user gratification theory which clearly states that the person uses and find their technology or uh, mode of uh, you know uh, technology and for their uh, specific a reason only like how if i want to watch news i know which website to go to uh, so my theoretical frameworks revolves around this theory completely uh, like how new new medias increase personal agencies and flexibility and how these uh, you know uh, these uh, new technologies help people uh, during covid 19 and how to disseminate news and when you are sitting a, a part of the world and you have to uh, you know take out some news and give it out in the world then this technology helps a lot uh my uh, my analysis and my question was also said the same thing in my questionnaire there was one question which was asked twice but in, uh, it was a trick question in which we asked that what is the pl platform they consume news mostly from uh, my study uh, clearly says that the preferred uh, dedicated news website is the website of my viewers uh, of my uh, uh, you know uh, research, like my my people who have done conducted the research on they chose dedicated news website that is like the wire or the hindu dedicated website and instagram that is the second most um, preferred platform for consuming news so this questions was asked twice and both the questions had a recurrence of instagram and both of them facebook is not so many because people uh, age group of 18 to 25 are is mostly active on instagram uh, now so according to this specific my research mobile journalism is something that is most likely to go uh, you know become more popular and uh, uh, the platform shift the paradigm shift of news consumption is must and is happening from throughout time uh, limitation of this is the only limitation of my study is that, that there was time restrictions and we could not uh, evaluate the full and uh, full aspects and this is just 18 to 25 so generalizing could be a little problem but my recommendation to this is that we have to build a global framework for mobile technologies in research and then further research in face like fake news and because 
uses via Instagram can also, uh, you know, help grow propaganda and all of that thing. So we have to take constraints of that, but this constraint of mobile journalism and uh, yeah, thank you so much. That's the only thing. Uh, I'm audible, sir. Yeah, you are audible. But uh, I have to give the suggestion. So, when you, I, simple suggestion, but you have to be concentrated about while you're presenting a PPT. But uh, that uh, you have to give some effort to make clear which are the point we have to be conveyed to the viewers first. Yes. Second one is, what is the informal interview? So informal interview is nothing. So uh, focus groups, so like where we talk to people informally, not like uh, not having proper discussion, like a focus group, but an informal interview. So what are the what are the output you can get from them? So out like uh, the questions which I asked in my interview was mobile technology has left an impact on mobile journalism as the industry. Do you think this is right or wrong? So uh, I had like six six people in my focus group who gave me. Uh, no, they had a discussion amongst themselves when they came up, uh, which I've written in this also, that fake news is also one of the constraints which they think and how it's easy for them to uh, access news before firsthand, uh, uh, like earlier from a newspaper. So that all the that all came out from that. Okay, do you, when I attend and conducting a focus group interview, did you mention any fake news or are... Uh... Came the yes, because there, was, there was one of the candidates from the focus group who specifically mentioned that fake fake news and propaganda is growing and uh, data breach is also one of the things we have to take care of. That's why in my recommendations, I've added that we have to take care of fake news and data breach. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Anmol. Uh, thank the you next so participant is Ajinkya Kavale, Postgraduate Media and Communication Studies, Christ University, Bangalore. Uh, his, to his topic is user experience of Indian news websites in online news interaction. Yes, uh, thank you so much. I'll just share my screen. Yes. Am I audible? Yes, you are very much audible. Please uh, screen share your okay. PPT. Yes. All right. Is this visible? Yes, you can start your presentation. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for giving me this platform to present my paper today. Uh, I'll be discussing uh, about the user experience of Indian news websites in general, and uh, and that is in the overall perspective of online news interaction. Um, so introducing after the internet boom in the 90s and the early 2000s, we have seen how um, um, smartphones, tablets, and computers have become the point of contact between a newsroom and the end user, which is a reader, a listener, uh, and a viewer in general. Uh, but uh, we also have to look at the overall design study of these news websites. And the primary motivation for me to take up this study was when a lot of times I used to visit a lot of Indian news websites, I used to be very frustrated by using them because half of the times I wouldn't find what I wanted. Uh, and the rest half was either spent in uh, haphazardly searching for things, uh, of being clueless, of not being able to access a lot of things. So I felt uh, a study possibly in this type of a genre is required. Um, so user experience is, uh, to put it uh, very simply, it is about how you can place the user at the center of your product and uh, you, can, uh, you can satisfy whatever the needs that the user has in terms of, uh, if we have to speak about news, it is about their news consumption habits, what type of news do they consume regularly, um, and all uh, related aspects. Uh, and this also has some editorial and technical challenges, wherein uh, if you have to speak about the technical challenges, is that uh, a newsroom is run primarily by journalists, and uh, they might not have necessary knowledge about design, uh, about the backend uh, product of it. Um, and as a result, your user experience becomes a very specialized uh, task, wherein we have to create a responsive design that uh, that is that more or less uh, attempts to solve user problems, uh, attempts to address what the user, what the reader wants, and what they don't want. Um, so um, I'll just move on to the next slide. So uh, I'll just briefly uh, skim through what 
the review of literature meant. So uh, there are certain aspects of uh, user experience wherein one is usability, wherein uh, roughly it means how you are users being able to use the website in order to achieve their goals. Wherein when I said I wanted to read something, but I couldn't, that generally means that a news website is not, is not usable enough. Uh, the second is user-centered design. Uh, as you discussed, we keep the user at the center of our product, and uh, which is a news platform. And we uh, navigate around their needs and problems, and we try to solve their needs and problems. Uh, these are certain uh, sections uh, of a general news website. Uh, one is a homepage, which is a primary gateway to uh, for a user to reach a website. Uh, from there, the user can move to certain categories of news, be it sports, lifestyle, economics, etc. The other is interaction. For instance, if I hover over a particular news outlet, is there a drop shadow? Is uh, when I hover, is the website responding to me? Uh, am I understanding? Is there a communication between me and the website wherein I understand uh, that my interactions also play a key role in uh, in that sense? So that is interaction here. Navigation is wherein how can I move around the website? Is it easy? Is the website laggy? Uh, among other things. So I came up with some research questions, which primarily um, tilted towards me understanding what are the key pain points of Indian uh, readers. Uh, and in general, does that discourage them or encourage them to uh, use websites or not? And this in general would also answer the usability part of, uh, of the research. So for the methodology, um, I conducted semi-structured qualitative interviews uh, and uh, each interview was divided into three different phases. Uh, and this was conducted from uh, start to end. So for example, I uh, interviewed eight different participants wherein uh, I started one interview, conducted all the three phases and then ended the interview. But there's also a point to note here that uh, to select those certain set of participants, I also had to run a questionnaire among my peers wherein um, I had to check whether they are using a news websites in the first place what kind of news do they consume and how much time do they also spend uh, i also required certain orientation from uh, from my uh, from the participants in the research uh, if they didn't have any i oriented them towards what i am trying to do uh, what user experiences what usability is and overall and uh, their proper consent was taken so phase 1 was to understand their news consumption habits Phase two was to understand the most common and frequent pain points. And the phase three was to understand what product opportunities can news organizations in the country have. Uh, the first theme was about advertising and unnecessary pop-ups. Uh, and this was the most recurring, recurring theme um, throughout uh, all the interviews, wherein they said their flow of reading was disturbed quite a lot of times. And that discouraged them from uh, staying longer on the website. And uh, while I understand news organizations would want to maximize the, maximize their revenue um, by putting in as many ads as possible, uh, that might turn out to be counterintuitive because this in turn discourage, discourages a viewer to log on to the website once again. So it is essential, it essentially means you're losing viewers by adding uh, more advertisements and pop-ups on, on the website. The second theme was about the product opportunity. As we discussed, it is about the personalization of news. So, um, users felt they only wanted to read what they liked. And to satisfy that, to um, necessitate, uh, necessitate that, uh, they recommended that they wanted news that is personalized, wherein if a particular person wanted to only read about sports news, they would only be wanting uh, their uh, news feed to be filled up with sports news. And uh, I think that is primarily also comes from a lot of Facebook and Instagram traits that have been picked up, wherein you're only recommended what you like. Uh, there is also an important point of discussion here, which I think can be another point of study, wherein some users also preferred that they didn't really care much about the pri their privacy and their preferences, and they were ready to barter their privacy for a certain set of news recommendations. So in, in a gist, they only wanted to read what they liked, and they wanted to cut through the shelf. Uh, the third was the simplicity of user interface. A lot of users uh, mentioned that they didn't really like very bold colors like red, orange uh, on, on the websites. And they felt that was very jarring and um, that discouraged them from staying on the website for a long time. In fact, they instead recommended for a more, uh, they said they preferred a more uh, simpler user interface in the sense that uh, black and white colors, uh, good high quality pictures, 
And this primarily is a mimic of what they usually used to read, that is newspapers. So to mimic that online, they just said clear fonts, uh, simple designs, minimal designs is what they preferred. Additionally, there, were, there was a, a case of a user who also said that uh, they didn't really, uh, they were colorblind. So they didn't really uh, understand colors as others do, which is a case of special ability. And uh, they said when there are a lot of colors on the website, that discourages them to move move off because they, they simply cannot read or they simply cannot understand. In fact, they also recommended that if it had been a black and white website, uh, they would be more inclined to uh, to read and go through it. So that also gives us a leverage and an opportunity to learn more about how news websites are also, uh, how news websites can also cater to uh, people who have um, special abilities. Uh, so concluding, as we discussed, uh, there, there were certain set of uh, pain points. There, there is uh, an added emphasis on the personalization of news. And I think there are untapped opportunities that uh, news websites in India can um, can exploit and they can execute. Uh, a lot of Western news websites like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times have added to their um, to their corpus of, of uh, digital uh, out, to their digital outputs and their digital pro products. And I think we also have the same opportunity here. Uh, the limitations here were that uh, there is a possibility because the interview time was limited and was semi-structured, it was a free willing discussion. There are certain user pain points that might have been missed. Uh, but I, uh, uh, as a personal recommendation, I felt over a period of a longer period of six months, wherein uh, we can do follow-up interviews and we can also remotely access with their consent of how they are consuming news of their news habits and wherever they are faltering. Uh, I think that can give us, uh, that can enhance the data set that we currently might might not have. Um, second was, uh, there might have been instances wherein uh, responses might have been exaggerated because news is a, is a socially desirable product. It is something that elevates social status. And as a result, the news consumption habits might have had uh, an exaggerated sort of response. And also I felt the current sample size was limited uh, due to financial and time constraints. Uh, over a, a longer period, longitudinal study can help us uh, tap uh, unknown pain points and also unknown demographics as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so to all the participants, thank you so much to all the seven, all the 10 participants who all presented in this session. It is my pleasure to take a moment to express my gratitude and appreciation to each and every one of you for your participation in this conference. I'm also proud of the way that you have conducted yourself during this session. Your professionalism, courtesy and respect for one another have created a positive and productive environment that has allowed us to achieve great things. I want to express my heartfelt appreciation to all of you for your participation in this conference and I wish you all all the very best in your future endeavors. And finally, thank you so much, Dr. T.K. Saravana Kumar, sir, for uh, guiding and appreciating and asking questions and uh, sharing your suggestions to, to the participants. I wanted to take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude for you. We know that it took more time than we expect. Thank you for being patient and listening to the entire presentation. Your insightful and thought-provoking remarks during the entire session helped set the tone for a productive and engaging conference. Your vision and leadership were truly instrumental in making this conference a success. And we are grateful for the opportunity to have been a part of it. Once again, thank you for the outstanding leadership and for creating such a positive and productive environment for us all. Thank you, everyone. Uh, you all can leave the meeting. The certificates will be generated directly to your mail ID. Thank you.